Praise the Lord, you reach Pastor Priscilla Hawley from Word and Worship Ministries. Let us go to the throne of grace. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we love you, we honor you, we worship you. We adore you. We humbly bow in your presence, thanking you for the revelation of the impartation of your divine wisdom. Let it be demonstrated through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit that all might receive what you have destined to be made known. We thank you for this opportunity. to continue to enlighten upon your divine word as we continue to worship you in the beauty of your holiness and honor you. In the very essence of your being, expound. upon your message. Let it leave an internal understanding of your kingdom principles and your desire to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. I'm gonna be coming from the writing of Matthews, and I'm going to be doing a revival for tonight, more on a college level, Bible study revival. I'm going to be coming from Matthew chapter 21, and it reads as thus, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, starting in the verse First verse to three. And were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, Ye shall say, the Lord have need of them, and straightway he will send them. In this passage, Matthew 21, 1 through 3, Jesus is instructing his disciples to retrieve a donkey and her colt for him to ride into Jerusalem. The phrase, the Lord have need of them, indicates that Jesus knew in advance that the animals would be required for this specific purpose. And he assured his disciples that if anyone questioned them about taking the donkey and colt, they were to respond with this statement. It is evident that Jesus had omniscience to know that a donkey and a colt would be at that location and made available for his need. Zechariah 9, 9 reads as this. Rejoice gently, greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the fowl of an ass. We see both prophetic, one the actual representation of the event in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, and then the fulfillment of the prophecy. 
The fulfillment of the prophecy, Matthew explicitly mentions that this event fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. By riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and a colt, Jesus is symbolically presenting himself as the Messiah's foretold by the prophets. The symbolism is the choice of riding on a donkey rather than a horse. It carries symbolic significance. In ancient times, a king riding on a horse symbolized war and conquest. Why riding on a donkey symbolizes humility and peace. By riding on a donkey, Jesus is presenting himself as a peaceful and humble king in contrast to earthly kings who typically rode on horses. Isn't it interesting that Jesus did not see the donkey and the colt? He had... omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient powers to know that the cult and the donkey existed. Sometimes God reveals to the human vessel things we don't see, but we know to exist. Foreknowledge. He gave the disciples foreknowledge where to go, what to expect, what to bring back. Even given further knowledge. If someone asks, about taking the donkey and the car to tell them that the Lord has need of them. It is interesting that from the very beginning of the entry unto Jerusalem, the King of glory is riding on a donkey, not a horse. We remember in the seven seals, when he returns, he's gonna be on a horse and bring divine judgment. The only one worthy to open up the seals, but entering in triumphantly into Jerusalem before the crucifixion, where everyone is Rejoicing greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fowl of an ass. The Messiah foretold by the prophet. We see his humility contrast to the conquering king that we will see in Revelation for the opening of the seals of the horse. It is interesting that we can surmise from all of the writings that this triumphal entry on Palm Sunday collaborates the fulfillment of the prophetic prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. The contrast between the entry into Jerusalem 
the triumphal entry, entry and the opening of the seven seals as found in Revelation 6. All reflecting his kingship and fulfilling prophecy. We address the fulfillment of the prophecy. We address the symbolism. Now let us dress the recognition as Messiah. The crowds who witnessed Jesus' entry into Jerusalem recognize the significance of this event. Let us go deeper into handling the meat of the impartation of the revelation about this entry. While the crowds are witnessing Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, they recognize the significance of this event. They spread their cloaks on the road and wave palm branches, which were symbols of honor and victory. As they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. As a reverence, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna and the highest. Keep in mind, they're spreading their cloaks on the road. They're waving palm branches. They're symbolizing honor and victory. They're shouting in adoration and reverence of acknowledging the arrival of a king. The, the son of David. This acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah further solidified his status as the long-awaited king of Israel. Overall, the event of Jesus riding in Jerusalem on a donkey and a colt is significant in the gospel because it marks a key movement in Jesus' ministry, fulfilling prophecy, symbolizing his role as the Messiah, and eliciting recognition from the crowds as their king. The fulfillment, the Messiah foretold by the prophets in Zechariah 9.9. 9. The symbolism, he's riding, presenting himself as a humble king. The king of glory is on a donkey. And a colt, not a horse, normally arrayed with chariots. Explicity, expression of power and wealth. Contrasting donkey and colt. He's been recognized as a messiah. For they have biblical prophecy that they are now aligning it with the recognition that he is truly the Messiah. So they are acknowledging him as the Messiah, waving palms, spreading their cloaks on the road. A joyful moment a processional. Adoring him, exalting him, acknowledging him, embracing him, desiring him, applauding him. Awaiting. the fulfillment of this Messiah to be the long-awaited king of Israel. What is so significant about this particular fulfillment 
as prophesied in Zechariah, is that when the Lord has need of some, that he requests, he knows exactly where it's at. He knows exactly how to retrieve it for his use. The Lord had need of them. The Lord had need of them. Let us take a further deeper in depth. overview of this passage. Jesus did not want to portray the exaltation of his kingship, an earthly king riding on a horse and chariots of great wealth and status he wanted to symbolize humility and peace as an ancient Jewish culture, as opposed to being associated as the king of war and conquest. Jesus wanted to portray himself as a humble king bringing peace. So the donkey and the colt was used to symbolize kingship and humility as opposed to war and conquest, which would be depicted on a horse. The practical transportation, donkeys were commonly used as a mode of transportation in ancient times, especially for those traveling short distances. Jesus, requesting a donkey and a colt to facilitate his journey into Jerusalem, knew he would be recognized and held by the people as the Messiah because it was prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. So he knew they had history. They had knowledge of history. They were Jews. They were studier of the Torah. They were studier of the word of God. They knew to anticipate a Messiah coming in humility, riding on a donkey and a colt. So he fulfilled the prophecy by entering in Jerusalem in the triumphal entry and what it was written that he would. Oh, adorned on. The Lord has need of them. It is significant that he comes in as a humble king, bringing peace, but yet would be later crucified. He's not coming for war. He's coming for peace. He's not coming to Congress. He's coming for peace. And they would see the entry as the fulfillment of Zechariah. Nine, nine. The Lord has need of them. What is also significant is that when God has need of you, he knows how to get your attention. When God has need of your services, he knows how to sin vessels to retrieve 
you, reveal to you, lead you through the spirit or any other means of communication to get you to the place where he can use you. Hear the donkey and colt in another location. In another location. But he knew it was there. Don't ever think Jesus doesn't know where everything is at in a world he created. He is truly all-knowing, omniscient. When Jesus have need of you, he will call you. He will draw you to him. And utilize what he has need of you for. The donkey and cult. Humility. Not as significant as the horse. But it served the purpose. Of what was prophesied. In Zechariah 9.9. 9, for all to see. Remember. Honor. Appreciate. Exalt. The acknowledgement of the fulfillment of the prophecy. When the Lord has need of you and he draws you to him, to the place where he has need of you to operate through you, all will see the humility. All will acknowledge the demonstration of his power. All will understand the fulfillment of God's will being performed through a vessel that is yielded to God to fulfill his perfect will at an appointed particular place and time. Anything that God has need of, he shall receive and utilize it accordingly. Anything that God has a purpose for, it shall be used to complete his purpose. Because when God has need of, what he has created for his pleasure. He's going to get the glory out of it. He's going to get the fulfillment out of it. He's going to get the recognition from it. He's going to get the satisfaction of fulfilling messianic prophecy. Hmm. Hmm. In other words, we've been created for a purpose. And that purpose is God has need of these vessels to be yielded to his perfect will. So that it will perform the good work that he's starting within you to bring it to completion. So that he can settle, establish, and perfect you for the working of his ministry. We can't change God's order. You can't mess up God's plan. You can have your plans messed up, but you can never mess up the plans of God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. You can never mess up the plans of God. Whatever God has need of, he shall receive. Whatever God deems necessary 
to complete his will, he shall utilize towards the completion of his will. This was a donkey in a coat made in lower standards of his image. He didn't have need of a horse. He didn't have a need of a king riding in on a chariot as a procession. He had need of humility to display humbleness, to display peace, to display a change of order, a change of perception, but yet royalty, power, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, but on a donkey and a coat. In other words, he didn't need to try to impress. All he had to do was show up and demonstrate his power. Go and bring me a donkey and a coat and tell them I have need of them. You can't mess up God's plan. You can't change his plan. You can't mess up his plan. You don't even know his plans until he reveals his plans. Because it's not about your will when he has need of. It's about his father's will. And he's fulfilling the will of his father. Jesus sees and utilizes whatever he has need of. You see, he sees in the future tense. He didn't see the donkey and the coat. He knew it was there. He sent the disciples to see it and retrieve it. Showing the powers that he behold. He knew if he sent for what he had need of, he was going to receive what he has need of. God will never have you to operate or do anything that he won't give you the necessity of what you have need of. He exemplified. He had a need, it was fulfilled. You have a need, it will be fulfilled. Whatever God's will be, it shall be. You see, good intentions will not bring the fruit of God's intent. Some may have thought of good intentions by offering him a horse, but that would have not been fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. 9. Which stated he should be on a donkey in a cult. Let us bring this to completion. The Lord has need of them. Whenever you are doing something for God, don't worry about what somebody say, face or feet or hands. The adversary is always busy in elements that are really not necessary. That's just a symbolical, non-literal representation of the body of Christ when it uses the human body to depict different 
body parts that can be used as God has need of. Because surely Jesus walked to sit upon the donkey in the colt on his two feet. Surely Jesus used his hands to hold on to the rope as he goes through the triumphal entry. Surely you saw his face. And surely he received and acknowledged the Hosea to the Son of God. Blessed is the one. As he rode in to Jerusalem. We, we, we cannot take everything that God has and try to depict and make it about you. Because God's kingdom is not about you. It's about him. What he has need of. And as you obey what he has need of, the reservoir will overflow into the need of your life. He'll fulfill what you have need of as he's taking care of what he has need of. You see, he had a need of a donkey and a coat to fulfill the prophecy of riding in to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday to fulfill Zechariah 9, 9. As he's fulfilling the prophecy, he's also fulfilling what those that were there had need of. They had need of recognizing the significance of the event. They had need of spreading their cloaks on the road. They had need of waving the palm branches. They had need of honoring and shouting Hosanna to the son of David. They had need of saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is the highest. So that the overall need of all participants would be that God is fulfilling his will. They were blessed. He was blessed. When you allow God to have his need and it overflows into your life to fulfill your need, you're blessed because you're blessed by the blessed soul. Because you humbled yourself and you fulfilled the humility the honor, the reverence, the acceptance of his will over your will. So the reservoir is the fulfillment of his need that overflows into the fulfillment of your need. There's a collaboration. There's a joining. There's a union. There's an impartation. There's a satisfaction. There's a revelation. There's an impartation. There's an agreement. There's a communion. That all needs are met by the Father's will. Whatever God's will be, it shall be. And so as Jesus came on the scene, he understood that he had to obey the Father's will. It was the Father's will 
that the prophecy be fulfilled. It was the father's will that he come in on a donkey and a colt. It was the father's will that those there in the entry into Jerusalem recognize the significance of the events. This is the Messiah. It was the father's will that they see, understand, recognize, accept, honor, embrace the king of glory in its humility. Whatever the father's will is, when you yield to the father's will, through allowing God to have this need fulfilled in your life, you are blessed. Because the blessing comes from God fulfilling his need and his will in your life. Something humanity can't take or surrender to stop. The hinder will not stop it. Because anything God is doing, humanity cannot stop. They don't have the power. Anything God is doing, humanity cannot rewrite because he's the author and finisher of your faith. Anything that God is doing, humanity does not have the last say so. Anything that God is doing, humanity doesn't fully understand. Those at the entry did not know that Jesus just drew the donkey in the coat to him. They didn't know that he didn't come already with the donkey in the coat. His disciples had to go retreat. We don't always see all of God's working. They just saw the entry. They didn't see the working prior to the entry. There are some unseen things that God are doing that we don't yet see, but we see the overflow of the fulfillment of what God is doing. We see the satisfying completion of what God is doing. We see the design and will of God being fulfilled. That's why you can't lean towards your own understanding. And some of you are leaning towards your own understanding, trying to fulfill your will over God's will, and it won't work. You want your ways, but you won't yield to God's ways. You want your recognition, but you won't recognize the Messiah. You want to determine your need, but you won't let God tell you your need. You want to handle it your way, but you won't let God reveal his way. And when God has need of, you don't want to humble and participate in his need of you because you're too busy trying to have your will over his will. You see, when God has need of, you're going to listen to the master's voice. You're going to listen to the master's will. Because no one overrides God's need. Because he's fulfilling scripture. The Bible says he came to fulfill the law. And he's returning again to conquer in war. He said he's a spirit. Stop viewing God the way you want to view him for your need that is not associated for his need. See, many would have wanted him on a horse 
but it was God's will that he be on a donkey and a colt to fulfill the messianic prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. 9. And some of you want to change God's will to fulfill the messianic prophecy. You can't change what God is playing. You don't have the authority. You don't have the will, the knowledge, nor the understanding. All of this was done that it might fulfill which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the fowl of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. When Jesus has a need, you have to go and do what Jesus commands you to do. Jesus sent them to retrieve the colt and the donkey. Obedience is a blessing. They returned with what God sent them to bring. They trusted that they would receive, find what God sent them to retrieve. They trusted that if they spoke, the Lord has need of them, it would be released to them of the Lord's need. We have to trust God at his word. We have to trust speaking what God says to speak because he upholds all things by the power of his word. Whether it's in song or whether it's in proclamation of the gospel or whether it's in him, or a spiritual song, or prayer. It's all God's word through his power, the demonstration of his Holy Spirit. Whatever God has need of, he uses the vessels to demonstrate his holy power. To fulfill his perfect will. You cannot mess up God's will. You cannot mess up God's plan. Because he's omniscient. He knows everything. It's impossible for him not to know. You know, human are saying, you messed up their plans. But nowhere in scripture will you ever see where God said you messed up his plans. That's impossible. For what is impossible with humanity is only made possible with God. In other words, human is not divine. Human did not have the last say so. Human has weakness and frailty. Humans make mistakes. Humans are ever learning. Humans need revelation. Humans need guidance and instruction and wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But God holds it all. Ha, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Lord has need of them. 
Hmm. Let's get ready to bring this to quote. Stop being limited to your own understanding and speaking what God is not authorizing to be spoken. A king normally comes on a horse to show authority, sometimes with chariots, sometimes to demonstrate war and conquest. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem for the triumphal entry in humility and peace on a donkey and a colt. It did not make sense, but it revealed Zechariah 9.9, 9, the fulfillment of the Messiah entering into Jerusalem. Everything God does may not make sense to you, but that does not determine the efficiency, the effectiveness, the knowledge, the wisdom and understanding of the most holy and righteous one in executing his will. It was not for the disciples to question whether or not the donkey and colt was there. It was for the disciples to obey and go and retrieve it. And if anyone asks, tell them what he said. I have need of them. He would have never told them to tell them if he didn't know they would have not asked. He would have never sent them to retrieve it if he didn't know they would not be there. He would have not rode in on a colt and a donkey had he not known he had to fulfill the Father's will. The triumphal entry. Everything that God writes Everything that God orchestrates and plans, you cannot change. He selected the two disciples that were to go and handle the job. He knew before they were born, they would be the one retrieving the donkey and the pope. He knew before the donkey and the pope were born that they would be at that location. He knew everybody that would be at the triumphal entry shouting, Hosanna to the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. He knows all things. So if theologically and doctrinally that we operate by faith, and obedience and to a holy and righteous God. How can you tell someone that God's plans are messed up? You can't theologically. What you can say is that your plans got messed up. You see, when Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, he knew everything would be at its location and it would all come in together. He knew that was the Father's will. Mm -hmm. Even if something happens, it's not to say Jesus wouldn't have known it would happen. Now, why this is not about having a child. Abraham was promised a child. We know that from scripture and Genesis. And if you read scripture, the Bible lets us know that Abraham went ahead of God. He lacked patience. And he began to try to work it out between him, Sarah, and Hagar. That was humanity's chain. That was not God's plan. Even when humanity gets in God's plan, 
and make their will to try to be manifested over God's will. God is going to fulfill his will because you cannot stop what God promises that he's going to do. The Bible says that it took 25 years from the promise of Isaac to a care where Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah 90. That's humanly, biologically, and possible for childbearing at 90 and 100. But God did. We see that Abraham and Sarah went ahead of God and Ishmael was born. But 14 years later, after Ishmael was born, when Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar tried to intervene out of the will of God, God still fulfilled his promise of Isaac to be born. You cannot stop God's plan. And anytime we say a plan is messed up, that is a warning for you to examine yourself that it wasn't God's plan. It was yours. Your plans can get messed up. Abraham, I, Abraham Sarah, and Hagar's plans was messed up. They had Ishmael. That was not the promise nor the plan of God. That was their doing. God still fulfilled his plan. Patience is necessary when God makes a promise. Steadfastness is necessary when God makes a promise. Obedience is necessary when God makes a promise. But whether you fulfill the patience, the obedience, or the steadfastness, God is still going to bring forth his promise. Ishmael came. That wasn't the promise. Isaac fulfilled the promise 14 years after Ishmael. Because the promise of God shall be fulfilled because God is a God that cannot lie. If he said it, it's going to come to pass. It's not your will, it's his will. And humanity has lost the blessing of God because it's all about their will. But this rebellion against God's will and to be blessed, it has to be about his will being fulfilled. So proceeding the triumphal entry where he says, tell them the Lord has need of them. He asks you to learn about a prayer to his father. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth or as it is in heaven. He's telling you, hold on to his will. is necessary for his will to be fulfilled. We all have a will. We all have ability to make choices. Your choices will never reap the benefits of God's blessings of his choice and will. It has to be the will of God. We can meditate on, we can read, we can sing, we can pray. We can proclaim, we can teach the word of God. And never fail to see to those who God has enlightened them through his will. The wisdom of God over the ways of the world.
You see, Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar handled it the way of the world. They looked at their biological clock and determined that God needed some help. They looked at their biological condition and determined that it was time to fulfill the promise that God has said. So they moved on their own out of the will of God. But 14 years later, something medically impossible, God fulfilled his promise by bringing Isaac. 25 years after the original promise, Isaac came and fulfilled the promise. When the Lord has need of something, he's going to get what he wants. And you can't change it. He didn't have need of Ishmael. He had need of Isaac. So Isaac came after Ishmael. One is the working of the flesh. The other is the working of the spirit. The working of the spirit will always be the more excellent fulfillment of God's plan. Because the working of the flesh is with lack of knowledge and understanding and leaning toward his own understanding. God wasn't making a mistake. He just never told Abraham when. He never told Sarah when. And sometimes we go ahead of God and we don't get the blessing because we're operating in the works of the flesh. But the blessing came through Isaac and not Ishmael. Isaac was the promised blessing. Isaac was the seed that God promised. Ismael was the work of the flesh through the collaboration, the moderation, the participation, the workings of Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. And it caused some contention. It caused some strife. It caused some jealousy. You see, strife, contention, and jealousy are works of the flesh. But God's works are works of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and self-control and meekness. So when you examine yourself, you see the difference between the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. The works of the spirits are the most excellent works and not of the flesh. Let us get ready to bring this to closure. The Lord has need of them. Mm -hmm. You see, the Lord had need of Isaac. Mm -hmm. That's why he fulfilled and bring it Isaac onto the scene after 25 years of making the promise. We don't want to wait on God. We want to go ahead and try to work out situations on our own will without allowing God to work it out on his will. Anything you work out on your will, God still has to come and do his will because your will will never be his will. Some of you still trying to have your will fulfilled. And it will never manifest God's will because God's will shall excel. God's will shall be exalted. God's will shall be upholded. And God's will shall come to pass. The Lord have need of them. That was God's will. The them. The donkey and the colt. That was God's will. Ice. Not Ismael. 
Ismael was the work of the flesh. That was God's will. Immaculate conception for Jesus Christ, his son. That was God's will. That Jesus ride in on a donkey in a coat for the triumphant entry to fulfill the messianic recognition of Zechariah 9.9. Nine. God's will is the more excellent way. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we have to stop trying to have our will over God's will. God's will is holiness. God's will is sincerity. God's will is reverence. God's will is honor. God's will is humility. And good intentions do not feel God's will. Don't allow anyone to deceive you towards accepting anything that is not God's will. You'll lose your blessing because God's will is fulfilled through obedience of his will. And those who desire his will he keep you now unto him who's able to keep you. He's able to keep you in his will and present you faultless. You won't be deceived by others' wills with exceeding joy. The only wise, immortal, invisible, eternal, holy and righteous, sovereign God, the Lord of all. The only one worthy of it all. The one that is consistently expressing and revealing the recognition that your good intentions will never overall magnify the blessing of God's will. Because your intentions are not the excellency of the power of God. The excellency of the power of God is God's will. Some of you need to stop focusing on humanity and focus on the excellency of the power of God's will. He didn't have the disciples to focus on the people. At the entrance of Jerusalem, he had the disciples to go look for the donkey and the coat. That was his will for them. If they would have just focused on the entrance of Jerusalem, they would not have been steadfast towards going and fulfilling the need that Jesus had for them to go to fulfill. They would have been out of the will of God. And not instrumental toward fulfilling the prophecy. But Jesus knew they would fulfill his will. Because Jesus knows all things. He's not going to select you. 
you're not going to fulfill his will. He selects those that will fulfill his will. He knows those that will obey him. He knows those that will humble themselves before him. He knows those that will desire his will over their will. And he operates accordingly. And let us bring this to God. Mm -hmm. See, that's why I don't let anyone define me. You can't define me. Because it's all about God's will. And God's will is not about you defining me. It's about God's will having a need. And he fulfills his need through fulfilling my need that I don't even know I have need of. Because he's the more excellent one, the more wiser one, the more victorious one, the more sovereign one. The only one that's worthy to drink of the cup. The only one that's worthy to obtain it all. The only one that's able to fulfill prophetic prophecy. According to God's will. That's why it's important to want God's will. If you don't want God's will, you're already in rebellion. And there are consequences for rebellion. But if you want blessing, you have to have the desire to want God's will. And he will reveal to you his will. All I want is God's will because I understand the wiser one chooses God's will because you have no knowledge to make proper choice when you don't know all of God's plan. He has to enlighten you and determine his will for your life. You don't let people make you think they can do anything. You better make sure you're in alignment with God's will. For the adversary has a will and people have a will. And whether the adversary will is not good intention and the people will may be good intention. None will be the more excellent if it's not God's will. It must come from the will of God. The more excellent way. The Lord has need of them. When God has a need of your life to fulfill his overall will, there's a blessing in yielding to it. No one can stop the will of God. makes no color, no difference what color you may have. That's the will of humanity. Whatever color you select is the will of humanity. But God is a spirit and he doesn't operate based on your color. He doesn't operate based on the color of one's skin, 
nor the color of your attire. Some of you better stop limiting God and placing your faith in trust in things other than the will of God. You better see further than your human sight and see you obtaining the will of God for your life. He specifically asked for a coat and a donkey. They selected the coat and a donkey that he wanted. It was the only one there. At a specific place. You don't know the place. You don't know the appointed time. He does. And some things are counterfeit. It's ahead of God's schedule or delayed of God's schedule, but God's schedule is going to always be on time. Ishmael was ahead of God's schedule, the work of the flesh. Isaac was just on time. Abraham and Sarah could not control God's will. Nor Hagar. Humanity cannot control God's will. I'm sure after Ishmael was born, they thought that was the promise fulfilled. God doesn't need your help. He needs you to obey him. And he'll work through you to fulfill his need, which will ultimately be a blessing in your life and fulfillment of your need. It was the disciples' blessing to be in the will of God, to retrieve what he had need of. They were a part of his plan. It's always a blessing to be a part of God's plan. His will. You see, this is about God's will. God's kingdom is not about your personal agenda. This was not about the disciples. Whether they were married or whether they had a child or how many children they had. This was about going and fulfilling God's will. And he selected those two disciples. He didn't select their wife if they were married. He didn't select their kids if he had a kids. He selected specifically the two disciples. No one else was to go, just the two disciples. That was the father's will. And many times we want to add to the Father's will that is not the Father's will. Many times we want to take from the Father's will that is not the Father's will. And we have to learn how to yield to the Father's will. And many have a rebellious spirit they want to keep telling you their will. They're in strongholds, strong delusion. The disciples knew it wasn't about them. It was about the Father's will for Jesus to ride the donkey and the colt in Jerusalem to fulfill the messianic prophecy. Some of you think it's about you and it's about the Father's will that's far greater than you. And you cannot 
fulfill the need because you will not yield to the Father's will. So then you don't become a part of his plan because he know you will never fulfill the yielding of his will. That's why some don't get enlightenment. They're not designed the Father's will. They want their will. But those who humble themselves will receive the enlightenment of the Father's will. And they will be a part of fulfilling the need. In other words, no one can stop the Father's will. If he have need of you for anything, and you yield to his will, you will be a part of fulfilling his need. And your need will be fulfilled. No one can tell you what God has need of you that comes from the Father's will. The people could not tell the two disciples that Jesus had need of them to go get the donkey and the goat. They didn't know it. That was not part of the Father's will for them to have that enlightenment and understand. It was the Father's will to see Jesus on the donkey and the colt, but not to know that Jesus asked the two disciples to go get it. In other words, God doesn't have to tell you everything. He doesn't have to tell you anything. And some of you are too busy trying to tell God that you can't even hear God. You won't even yield to him. You're too busy trying to tell him. That's not even theologically, doctrinal, biblically in alignment with his word. He's a spirit. He knows all things. He transcends all things. Let us bring this to closure. The Lord has need. It's always an honor and a privilege when the Lord has need of you. He has created everybody for a purpose. And when he reveals that purpose, you'll know it. When he reveals that purpose, he's humbling you to know what his will for your life is. Some of you are too entangled and thinking that somebody's trying to do something for you when it's God that's trying to show you what your purpose is that he wants to fulfill in your life. It was needful that the two disciples be there to fulfill Jesus' need. It was needful that the donkey and the colt be there to fulfill Jesus' need, which ultimately fulfilled the Father's will. And it's all about the fulfillment of the Father's will not your will. It is rebellion to desire your will over the Father. It is ignorant 
to continuously speak your will and manipulate to try to have your will over the Father's will. There are consequences. And the Spirit of God testifies to the desire of fulfilling the Father's will. That is an agreement. Intimacy, union with the Father through the Son. That his will be done. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for fulfilling your will. You are spirit, Father, so we hold on to your power, your excellency, your sovereignty, your majesty, your lordship, the spirit realm. We can't always see, but you reveal, you enlighten, you make known. As we yield and desire to obey your will. Father, we thank you that whenever you have need, we yield to your will. Our life is all about your need. that overflows into our life, that completes our need. Because we belong to you. And you have the ultimate authority over all. And so God, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for the humility and the fulfillment of your prophecy. We thank you for this message the Lord have need of them. A donkey and a colt. We pray that you will always let us know your will. And when you have need of our vessels to fulfill your will, that we will yield in humility and allow your Holy Spirit to work through these earthly vessels which is the excellency of the power that reside within. We honor you, God. We praise you. We worship you. In the desire of your holiness, let it be a sweet, sweet fragrance in your nostril. Mm. A fragrance of acceptability. Pleasing in your sight. We thank you for all you continue to do. Show us those you had need of and how you commission them to fulfill your need, a mandate you had upon their life that fulfilled your overall purpose from Moses to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, David, Mary, and many more, John the Baptist, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of the prophets you had need of, and they fulfilled your will. Jonah, while some had reservations, you ultimately got your will from them through their obedience. We thank you, Father, for that. Even when some made mistakes, you still was able to get your will orchestrating and moving through their lives. All in an effort 
to show them the necessity of your will over thy will. That's the more excellent way. That's a measure of protection because this wisdom that guides and leads and corrects. And withhold from operating out of your will. It's an armor that cannot be broken. And the adversary cannot penetrate. So we honor you with that, God. We honor you, God. We look forward to the next message. The Lord have need of them. That will give a biblical character. In the need, the execution, and the fulfillment. The need, the execution, and the fulfillment. And the overall blessing of it all tying together for your glory. The fulfillment of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You see, when the Lord has need, no one can determine the Lord's need. The location, the time, nor the will. God has to reveal it. And there's not change by him at it. It will never be changed by humanity. We can see that in Genesis. Just in the life of Sarah and Abraham. Mm -hmm. It was needful that Sarah and Abraham have Isaac. So that Abraham would be the father of many nations. And that he would be a blessing. The seed of Abraham. You cannot change God's will. Even when you work it out in the flesh, God's will shall be manifested in the spirit realm and fulfilled. We must learn how to wait on the promise. Because God doesn't give you the exact implementation of the timing of the promise. And so we are to have patience. Let patience have its perfect work that we might be complete and entire, wanting nothing. That's the fulfillment of his will in our life. It completes. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now. I know, oh, he touched me and made me 
Oh, oh, he touched me. Oh, yeah, yes. The Lord, you see, he touched me. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul, the joy that the world didn't give, something happened. And now I know my Lord, my Lord touch me and made, oh, we made me whole. Since I met this blessed since Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternal, eternally. He touched me. Oh, the Lord, the Lord, he touched me. You see, and all the joy that filled my, 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 my soul. Something happened, and now I know my Lord. My, my, my Lord, touch me, and he made, he made me whole. Oh, did he touch you? Did the Lord touch you did he touch you and feel your very soul something happened and now I know he, oh, the Lord, my, my God, touch me, and he made, my Lord God, he made me whole. Mm. He touched me. You see, he changed my life. He touched me. Yes. And all the joy, the joy that filled my, my soul. Something happened. And now... I know 
he touched me. I thank you, Lord, and he made, he touched me, and he made, he touched me, and made me whole. There's something about God when he touches you and make you whole. That is his will, that he touches you, fill your very soul and makes you whole. He that have begun a good work in you shall bring it to completion. Let perfect patience have his perfect work that you might be complete and entire, wanting nothing. The Lord has need of them. Mm. A fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9. Never let God not be first in your life. Mm. Always be humble and yield to the Father's will. There's a blessing and yielding to the Father's will. But when he has need of you, he shall draw you. And to his will to fulfill his purpose and plan for your life. Amen. 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 There is something about worshiping God. There is something about outwardly worshiping God and honoring him in his entire. It changes everything because you understand and you accept his will. He was the only one worthy to obtain it all. He was the only one worthy to drink of that cup. He was the only one worthy to bow before the throne of grace and cry, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessings. For thou has created all things and all things have been created for thy pleasure. The king of glory. Hmm. The king of glory. The king of glory. What are you desiring? His will or your will? God makes no mistakes. Your will can be changed and modified by God's will. But you shall not change God's will. For all things works together for good unto God. According to his purpose and will. For those who are called and love him. If you love him, you'll want his will over your will. And then you'll behold the blessing of his will. The joy that's unspeakable that the world can't give nor take away. It's the Holy Spirit operating. 
that is your inner strength. That's well-pleasing in his sight. Amen. Amen.